Welcome to the May forum presentation by the Oregon City Business Alliance. You're probably wondering why are we here in the Abigail Gardens today instead of um, in the ballroom? Because it's so beautiful, that's why. Isn't this amazing? Um, I personally would like to thank Dan and the whole staff for reminding us that you have this amazing facility and uh, that you made it available for us to be able to hold our event here today. So how about a quick hand of applause for Dan and his crew. No, really, it's beautiful, and I, I'm sure you're very busy during the summer months. Well, today we're going to um, go in another direction. We've kind of talked about all the things that are happening with the Legacy Project, and as you probably know, they're going to be having their unveiling of their first phase of the Riverwalk um, June 3rd at OMSI. Uh, they're going to have parking available, refreshments. Uh, it's going to be an amazing um, presentation. They're anticipating close to a thousand people will be there for that. So if you can make yourselves available, I'm sure you'll be excited to see what they have to share. But that's that direction. That's going to be coming down the road. More importantly, here in Oregon City, we like to talk about at the Oregon City Business Alliance, what is going on today? What is it that we as members can do to help support expansion, new development, uh, attracting new businesses to our area today. And I think when you, if you look at the renderings and illustrations that have been displayed here, it's pretty impressive. Uh, Oregon City is turning a new chapter uh, in its history of really being able to offer type A quality office space, retail space, residential facilities. Um, and it's all happening in the north downtown area of Oregon City. Not, not a lot of people know about it, but it's really exciting. So if you think about bookending all of this economic activity with the legacy project at the other end, the southern part of Oregon City, just think about the opportunities there are in downtown to fill in in between. And I know as we go forward with the Business Alliance, we'll have other speakers that'll be talking about the different businesses and different uses that'll be going on some of the vacant uh, lots that the city owns presently. And I know Eric Underwood in his talk today will touch on that. But, um, you know, we have a lot of new people here today that haven't been here before. And I thought, uh, why not just real quickly go around the room and introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about who you are uh, and uh, what you're doing, what you do for a living. So if we could, we'll start out over here. <laughs> Did I get you with your mouth full? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name's Tony Jimenez. I'm the uh, general manager at Oregon City Subaru um, on Main Street there. And uh, I've been with uh, Lithium Motors for 25 years and uh, moved up to Oregon City in 2011. And uh, just, I mean, really amazed at the city's growth just in the short time I've been here. So uh, that's, that's all I have. Thank you, madam. You're welcome. Hello, uh, Eric Underwood, Economic Development Manager for Oregon City. John. Oh. John Southgate, Consulting for the Economic Development Department of Clackamas County. Leanne Hogue, Economic Development Coordinator at the City of Oregon City. Uh, Lloyd. Uh, Hill Architects, an uh, architect and planner with a number of projects ongoing in Oregon City. Ed Darrow, the developer of The Cove, as the original master planner and uh, brought in the first phase guys uh, out of uh, Denver. And they are moving that forward very nicely. It's been a little tough winter for them. Uh, but uh, today we'll present phase two, and that's uh, what we have on the boards. Good afternoon, I'm Nancy Ide, City Commissioner in Oregon City. Good afternoon, Alice Norris, former mayor of Oregon City, and today wearing my hat with Rediscover the Falls, the friend and fundraising arm of the Willamette Falls Legacy Project. Ashley Pacheco, commercial lender with Columbia Bank. Jenny Nichols, branch manager for the Oregon City Office of Columbia Bank. Steve Van Haverbeek, Urban Renewal Commissioner, and uh, Friends of the Library Bookstore. Brian Slack, Sellers Corner, Downtown Oregon City Board. Uh, 
Craig Morrow, Oregon City Brewing Company, uh, right down the street, underneath the free beer sign. Um, so, <laughs> kind of catches your eye. Uh, Got to read the fine print, though. Um, anyway, I'm also on the board at Main Street downtown. So, I'm David Green with uh, Citizens Bank here in Oregon City, uh, also on the board of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and we do not have a free money sign. <clears throat> I'm Mark Ellingson from Lewis and Clark Bank. I also serve on the Chamber Board as also a Rotarian. Uh, Bob Hall with the YMCA of Columbia Willamette, and I'm also on the board with Ellis at Rediscover the Falls. <clears throat> uh, Nick Varosky, I'm on the board of the Oregon City Business Alliance, uh, downtown property owner. I'm Jerry Herman. I train young adults and youth to be tour guides and environmental landscapers. I'm Jack Shumate, I pastor One by One Church. We currently meet at Eastham, just up the road of the school, and then our offices are down on Washington, so this is right in our neighborhood. It's exciting. I'm Paul Edgar, uh, been active in the community, and I'm a member of the Clackamas County Advisory, uh, Veterans Advisory Committee, and on a uh, issue of trying to solve homeless veteran issues of homelessness in this region. Hi, I'm Janie Malloy with Better Homes and Gardens, as well as Friends of the Clackamas Cove. Hello, William Gifford here uh, with smallflags.com and also uh, uh, director of the Oregon City Business Alliance. And I'm Kent Ziegler, president of the Oregon City Business Alliance. Hi, Mike Mitchell, Oregon City Parks Foundation and Urban Renewal Commissioner. Dan Fowler, Abernathy Center, Historic Properties. Um, I'm a proud member of the hospital board and a member of the End of the Oregon Trail, Clackamas Heritage Partners Board, as well as Oregon City Business Alliance. And thank you all for being here today. Hi, I'm John Lewis. I'm the Public Works Director for Oregon City. I also manage the Development Engineering Group, who approves a lot of these great projects and squashes a lot of dreams that aren't so good. <laughs> uh, Brian Shaw, and I guess I'm the only one who got the memo about what to wear today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mike's pretty close over here. Yeah. Uh, I'm a building designer, uh, manufacturing engineer, and also city commissioner with Ms. Ide over here. I'm Russ Reinhardt. I'm the chief exec at Providence Willamette Falls right up the, the road there. And if you haven't been by lately, we're putting in a new medical office building across the street. So we've got a project going on right now. I'm Lowell Miles. I have Miles Fiberglass and Composites, family-owned business. We have a manufacturing facility down here on Main Street. Also one on Audi Road in the freeway uh, north of here. Uh, we've been here a little over 50 years, and I'll give this to my daughter. Uh, Lori Olin, Miles Fiberglass and Composites. I'm Pastor Mike Altman, Living Hope Church in Oregon City. Keep the main thing, the main thing, a member of the Chamber of Commerce and by local. Lynn Wallace, Economist with Oregon Employment Department. Claire Met, um, antique dealer, and also um, with the Historic Review Board and the um, Willamette Falls Heritage Area Coalition. My name is Sam Drivo with Energy Kayaking. Uh, we love clean rivers. I'm on the tourism board with Clackamas County. I'm Gail Yasolino. And center. All right. That's who I am. <laughs> Blaine Meyer, I serve on the board of the uh, Oregon City Business Alliance that I'm owned by First City Cycles and First City Central Bistro. And then I serve on the uh, Clackamas County Ped Bikeway Committee and uh, let's see what else, uh, Oregon City Parks Foundation and yeah, so we, and the Lions Club. I'm Jim Austin with Clackamas County Tourism and Coordination, or, uh, Community Relations Coordinator. My name is Phil Lewis. I'm the Community Services Director for the City of Oregon City. 
I'm Vern Johnson, uh, OCBA member and uh, new uh, Oregon City uh, Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Bob Long. I am a stockbroker, an insurance and financial advisor, member of the Oregon City Chamber, Rotarian, and most importantly, my mother loved me. Good morning. Afternoon. Shonda Horan, Double J Construction. Also sit on the Oregon City Chamber Board. Don Slack, Acting Treasurer today. Yay. Only. Yay. And I'm Sherry Henson. I'm a business banker and lender for Columbia Bank, and I also sit on the Board of Directors for this great organization. As you learn that. Thank you to introduce yourself, because you're always in the back. Uh, Melody Ashford, uh, Willamette Falls Media Center, Executive Director, and Chief Bottle Washer. Perfect. As many of you know, as many of you know um, Willamette Falls Media Center does go ahead and record all of our forum presentations. Um, Nick Dirkman is going to be working with William and a few others to go ahead and update our website. So we'll have all of the forums available for you to go ahead and download in case you miss uh, one of the events. So today, we're going to mix it up a little bit. We've got a number of presenters that are going to be discussing the various projects that they're involved with. And then we're going to have Eric kind of do a summary at the end of just kind of a lot of success stories that are taking place in Oregon City beyond the North Downtown District. So to start out with, uh, Ed, if you'd like to come on up, and Lloyd, I think you're going to be assisting Ed uh, as he talks about phase two of the Cove. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we all know of the Cove. It's been around for quite a while. I see Alice here from years ago. Uh, <laughs> well, we've been hanging out together. So really, we, uh, we were invited as a developer to come to the table and see what could be done on the Cove, and this was back in 2008. There were quite a few developers that were uh, set out. Uh, we were ultimately chosen to do the project uh, and uh, went forward with doing concept plans, uh, then got into a MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with the city, and then that ended up going into a DDA, a Disposition and Development Agreement, which we're still working under. So it's been a 10-year program, and we're right on schedule. So <laughs> to, uh, to talk about uh, what's going on in the first phase, <clears throat> they're not here today. Uh, I invited uh, uh, Don Simpson, who has a company over in... Uh, in uh, he has it up in Seattle and in Denver to do phase one, which is 244 garden apartments. That's under construction. Uh, they hit a pretty tough winter. Uh, spoke with them today. They are getting back on schedule. The intent would be to actually start two buildings next week. So they're actually gonna go vertical out of the ground. The uh, grading will continue probably for another three months and they expect to have the project completed at the end of 18. So it's a pretty extended profile, but it's been a tough site. A lot of unique things, unique dirt. And then <clears throat> the subject of today's conversation is the phase two, uh, and that's the waterfront units. There are 378 units there. <clears throat> and then phase three is a mitigation area. And then phase four will be the in-water uh, program. Uh, Lloyd uh, Hill is here today. Come on up, Lloyd. Lloyd's the architect who has worked with Phase One <clears throat> and has consistently worked with me uh, since 2008. Actually, we met Ed in September, October 1992 over in Newport at the beach. <laughs> at the beach, when you were working on a project that uh, I had started, and uh, you know, I got to know you over the next year or so, and we've done how many projects together now in the last 25 years? Uh, too many. Too many. <laughs> Yeah, that was a good project. It was 100 acres uh, on the ocean in uh, Newport. Beautiful setting there called South Shore. Uh, but getting back to this project, <clears throat> in terms of the, the new concept, uh, we have a total of, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different buildings. And they are uh, a D building, which has this little book in, uh, another one over there. And then these are all facing the water. Originally, we had this uh, back in 2008. We had a plan for 224 condominiums with uh, subterranean parking. 
about 390,000 square feet. Uh, so what we've done to date to update that, <clears throat> we've taken what in fact was single loaded buildings, meaning there was only one unit facing the water, and we now are double loading that. So we've increased the number of units, but we've decreased the size of square footage on the overall project. Uh, the nice thing is that it still has the subterranean parking and everybody within this building <clears throat> has enough parking below their building to be able to get an elevator and go up. So it's, it's well planned in terms of parking ratios. Uh, you had anything to add to that, Lloyd? Well, the, the single loaded buildings, uh, of course, the motivation was the beautiful view out to the cove. And in that case, every single unit got a view of the cove. What we've managed to do with this design where um, on this plan, the, you know, the ground level units that are in orange are going to be live work units. So this will qualify for the vertical housing tax incentive program. But the, um, the other units that are in, in tan um, stack up all the way. And, and with these plans, we end up with about 75% of the units having really great views out to the, to the cove. So there's uh, a few units that don't have water views, but the vast majority do have water, water views. And if you don't understand the live work program, that's where you'll have a unit uh, on the second floor where you live and you go down on the bottom floor and that's your work area. Now those were very popular. Uh, they've gone very well up in Canada. They've gone well downtown. Uh, and our, one of our partners that are in the project with us is the Canadian firm who has done several uh, millions, uh, matter of fact, probably $5 billion worth of product in the Canada area. <clears throat> Let's get to the little presentation here if we can see it. Okay, uh, we have the waterfront area, which is what we were talking about, which is the phase two. Floyd, you'll point that out. Then over here is our phase one. And phase three is this mitigation area. And the intent of the mitigation area is to really keep the water uh, at the cove at a high level of quality. Uh, you're able to uh, produce this uh, you write the check for it, then ultimately you can sell credits to the bad guys up the river who have actually polluted, and they pay anywhere from two fifty to three hundred thousand dollars an acre. And then we take that and we put that into a sinking fund, and we make sure that we keep the cove healthy. Then a phase four <clears throat> would be our in water. Uh, we have a water sports center over here. Then we've got a. a, a a deck that would come out here, which would be just for going out and sitting on. And then uh, I think that's it. what we have. As you recall, there's the big steel pilings out there. We like to cut those down and put uh, swim docks on those. So it'll become a very public place. <clears throat> this is showing the plan back in 2007. We had apartments over here, which we do now. Uh, we had waterfront condominiums. We had floating homes, which was actually uh, kind of outlawed by the commission. They said, we don't want to have anything in the water, so we took that out. Uh, then we had an amphitheater over here, and we had a hotel here. <clears throat> 2008, we had the condominiums, which are very similar to what we have here. Ultimately, we would like to convert phase two from uh, rental units to condos at some point in the future. So we had that in this 2008. We had a, a uh, medical center here, and then we had a mixed use project here. And this is our current plan, <clears throat> which is, uh, we just went through, which is this diagram. And then is there anything special here that you'd, uh, let's go to the center. Uh, corridor here. Uh, let me turn this over to Lloyd. He's our architect. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we've explored a number of um, alternatives for what to have happen at the middle of the waterfront site. <clears throat> when we first started working on it with Ed eight or nine years ago, uh, the, the residential part was three buildings on this side and three buildings on this side, and there was a not too defined plan for some combination of, of retail or other commercial office, uh, you know, kind of spaces here. Um, there's been thoughts of maybe doing a hotel there. Um, 
what we've really arrived at uh, with the latest round of thinking is that we want to create um, a public plaza here. <clears throat> uh, this is an enlargement of that area. And I'm sure a number of you have uh, maybe been over to the farmer's market in Lake Oswego at Millennium Park, which is by the, <clears throat> there's been some new development uh, overlooking the bay in Lake Oswego. Um, that park where they have the, the farmer's market is about 60 feet wide by 300 feet long. So to put things in scale, <clears throat> this is 80 feet from building to building, and this is 240 feet from here, plus another 80 or 90 feet if you go down the steps. So this is a similar size area to Millennial Park where they have the, <clears throat> the Lake Oswego Farmers Market. Now we, you know, we'd like to design this public space so that it's something that could be used for events, maybe a boat show or a car show. You know, who knows, maybe it could be Farmers Market in the future if we can figure out how to park enough people. Um, but in addition to the, you know, the public access, there'll be steps down to the esplanade. There'll also be ramps that you could <clears throat> skateboard or bicycle or walk um, if you're handicapped um, to get down to the, the lower level. <clears throat> and the two buildings that front on this um, are more or less mirror images. The part of the building that faces Agnes Street here, this part, will have <clears throat> retail fronting the street on the ground floor. <clears throat> this building has two restaurants in it. One would have an entrance right facing the street. The other will have an entrance off the plaza. <clears throat> and then three levels of units over the top of this part of the building. On the part of the building where it's closer to the water, <clears throat> the top floor, rather than being units, will be uh, a roof deck uh, with views out to the lake. <clears throat> um, it could be a rooftop bar or restaurant, or it could be um, a, a rooftop amenity space for the residents that, <clears throat> that rent or own units in, in the project here. Uh, so uh, the, the program here is about 8,000 or so square feet of retail space, um, another eight or 9,000 square feet of restaurant, including some pretty generous size outdoor um, seating areas that could be covered with gas heaters and so forth and fire pits and so forth. Um, and then there's a community center, which is six or 7,000 square feet with a pool, a spa, <clears throat> you know, outdoor grill, fire pits, and outdoor areas for sun loungers and so forth. So our hope is that this becomes a lively kind of a community center for the residents that live here, <clears throat> you know, with, um, you know, 378 units, I think, is the current plan uh, here, plus another 244 units um, at the Garden Apartments here, you know, all of a sudden we've got six or 700 units with residents, uh, plus anybody who comes to the area. So we think we're starting to get the critical mass to, to actually make some of these uh, commercial spaces and restaurants viable. Thank you. And as, if you have any questions that we're moving through, certainly just go right ahead and, and interrupt and ask. Uh, one of the nice things about this plaza area is that we will be able to have programs here, programs in the center, uh, and really make it a public space. That's the intent. We've done a number of <clears throat> waterfront projects, like eight, and <clears throat> in a lot of projects you'll see where the developer wants to close off the front and just make that for the residents. Every project that we have done, we open it up to the public. We want the public there. We want it to be an exciting area. This esplanade is currently designed at 20 feet wide. Uh, we could actually have antique cars come down here, park here, have a venue for that. Uh, it'll be a good walking space. The one that we did over on the Columbia a few years ago, that was only, um, that was 12 feet. Uh, and that gets used so much, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's just amazing the amount of people that are walking that. So that's kind of the, the basic program. Let me get back to our slides. So this is the back of the Esplanade area, and these are strictly conceptual at this point. We're going through a whole new iteration. Uh, we've uh, got uh, uh, Lloyd, who's been with us consistently. We brought some additional consultants on to do landscaping, concepting. So in the back area here, there will be an opportunity, and it's not showing it, but this is the front entrance. Let's see. This is the back area, Esplanade down here, uh, the patio and the seating uh, for people that are at the restaurants uh, out in the back area. 
I don't know why it goes off here, but this would be in the center plaza area in one of the, the uh, community centers where we'd actually have a fitness uh, and a lounge and a leasing office uh, for the uh, project. We would like to have <clears throat> another resource there that would allow people to come down to a deli, uh, pick up sandwiches, go out and sit on the esplanade, the patio, maybe have a place where we uh, would uh, have bicycles and uh, kayaks. And then this is the way that Live Work program works. You'd have a unit up on the second floor. There'll be an interior stair. These will be about 1,100 square feet. You'd go down and you'd have a full workspace below. And the reason that the state put this together is so that you can take uh, traffic off. As a matter of fact, we just completed our traffic study. And from our last design, we are almost 1,700 trips per day less. So it's, we've kind of gone backwards, even though there's more units because we had 80,000 square feet of office, we had another 50,000 square feet of office. Dropping those out <clears throat> has actually given us a margin of uh, additional traffic. So we're not gonna be imposing on the traffic program. Then uh, at the, you might point to that location on the master plan there with the amphitheater. <clears throat> That's 5.2 acres. Phase one has taken and cut that out and then we'll go back in and finish it uh, doing a small platform area for a venue for music. Uh, and then this will all be a bowl here. And then out in front of that, <clears throat> I've called the uh, Sea Scouts who had uh, contacted me about using the Sheriff's uh, Boathouse, which is down here, and redoing that and making that the uh, Water Sports Center. So I said that I would work with them, uh, actually turn over any rights that I have uh, to do that as long as they will in fact sponsor programs for kids, for water safety, uh, sailing, and what have you for the public. We'd like to put in a little public pier, if you could show that on the site plan there, Lloyd. Be directly off there. And it's not for boats. The, there's been a lot of uh, issues come up with different groups that have uh, called us, talked to us. Uh, do not want to see motorized boats uh, in the cove. We originally had a couple of marinas planned. Uh, there is not, we don't have the right to outlaw that, but we certainly cannot sponsor it by putting in big marinas. So the intent would be doing that dock area. Uh, <clears throat> something like this would be more on a human scale, not for boats, but if you had your paddle boat and you wanted to go up to that and tie up, you could do that or uh, just to, you know, enjoy the area. So ultimately, we've got paths, we'll have the water sports center, uh, we'll have the amphitheater, and the, really the intent is to make this as public as is possible to make it enjoyable not only for the residents, but for anybody that's coming into town. And we like to say that we've changed the environment, we've made it better. Uh, if you look at the two pieces of property, they were brownfields. Uh, we did a tour. Matter of fact, uh, if you come up, Jerry, you might give a little idea on our tour. <clears throat> William, William should come up too. William Gepper? Okay. Hey, William, where are you? Come on up here. All right. Just because you look good. <laughs> <laughs> this is really an honor for me to work with developers of this quality because everything they've done, we looked at it eight years ago, were projects that we thought were significant, but then to see other projects they've done are in the area. William and I, come on up here. And Ken Ziegler decided it was time to do a development discovery tour. We did that during Alice's tenure as mayor, too, to get the project kind of idea going, but to really see fine development being um, <clears throat> put together. William and I and the OCBA, my organization, Rivers of Life uh, Center with Youth, worked out the itinerary. We went to a bunch of places. Where we go? Remember those? Well, of course, we started at the Cove. Then we went over to Lake Oswego. What's the name of that? Oswego Point. Oswego Point, yeah, beautiful, beautiful setting. And then we saw a former gravel pit someplace over in Portland. <coughs> Moss Prospect, Prospect. Prospect Lake, yeah. What they've done with what could just be a, a horrible eyesore was amazing. We learned a lot about the projects. And the really important thing was we learned the constraints, the difficulty of the cove is, is the former brownfields that he's been talking about. Two landfills up gradient, 
have contributed to difficulties. But all these sites, when you look at them cumulatively, show that people can make a difference and we can get these jobs done. And I'm just really pleased that we could do that. I also feel the development discovery tour, tour model, I think William and I agree, should be done on all the projects here in Oregon City that people are doubting or wondering about. That's what we want to promote is the idea that we should have these discovery tours for the public uh, as well as elected officials to go out to the sites, get your, get your feet on the ground and see where these, where these, uh, uh, where these projected plans uh, can be uh, made into reality. I think it's a swell idea. I thank you for that, Jerry, and, and for Ed for promoting that. The nice thing about it uh, from the prospect uh, of the developer is you can actually show people what you've already done. There's nothing better than say here, we have did this, and this is how we did it, and this is the way it's turned out. Uh, the Lake Oswego was 48 acres. It was an old cement plant. We tore that down. We saved uh, $500,000 worth of steel, recycled the concrete used for roads. It's 22 years ago. So we've been doing it a long time. And when you ultimately go back to these places and you say, my gosh, one of the planners came up and said, you know, you actually did what you said you were going to do. So it's, it's nice to get the compliments on it, and it's nice to do it right. So if there's any questions, certainly uh, ask me. Phase two won't begin until next spring. Uh, we have a lot to do with this uh, new design. Lloyd's working hard. We've got the engineers working. So everything is moving forward. And it'll be timely because phase one will just be completing. So we can actually just kind of skip right across. Yes. Yes, uh, you release buildings. Uh, oh, will there be people living there before the end of construction? As in most large apartment projects, you get certificates of occupancy on the first buildings, and as you move down, as long as you have all of the basic uh, services available, you know, a fire, et cetera, you can actually start releasing buildings and moving people in. Typically, in a, a project of this nature, you'd go anywhere from 18 to 30 units a month would actually be absorbed. So it takes quite a while to absorb that many units. So you start as soon as you can and as soon as you've got things in place. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, public parking. So parking, traffic, um, you know, those are two hot buttons. Ed's already talked about the traffic and the fact that this revised proposal reduces the traffic impacts. Uh, so the city's parking standards for this part of the city would require 4.1 cars per thousand commercial square footage or, or restaurant square footage. Um, and it's a sliding scale, one per, one per studio unit, one and a quarter per one bedroom, one and a half per two bedroom, one and three quarter for a three bedroom unit. So the residential units, that ends up coming out to somewhere around 1.5 or 1.5 six in a 1.5 units um, in a per um, in a or parking stalls per unit to meet the city standard um, the reality is that we live in a in a in a society where people get to decide if they want to rent an apartment here or not and if we don't have enough parking they're not going to rent there so what we have provided um, you, you can't really see it on this plan but there's an entrance under the building um, here into a garage um, there's also an entrance here and an entrance here. So there are three entrances. And that garage runs continuously the entire length of the site. And at either end, there's a, um, a, a way to turn around and get going the other way. Um, and in the middle, there's two layers of parking. And uh, so that parking, which you don't see on the site plan, um, amounts to a little over one car per unit for each of the buildings. So every unit in the building will have an assigned space. Uh, which they can park at and, and go directly to the elevator, be protected from the weather. <clears throat> In addition to that, we have um, angled parking um, between the street and the buildings in these two locations. And uh, the total of the parking for <clears throat> um, the, 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 the structured parking under the building and the angled parking in front of the buildings here uh, exceeds the city's parking standard requirements. Um, in addition to that, we're proposing with this latest version of this, and this hasn't gone through planning and engineering, so we still have some, uh, some things to do, but we're proposing having some 
parallel parking on street here, on this side here, and you know here. And we're also proposing having some angled parking directly in front of the restaurant and commercial spaces here. Um, so we get another 115, 110, 115, 120 cars of parking on the street, which um, I think if this has events, plus, plus there is uh, community parking for the amphitheater park here, and there's also trailhead parking in the master plan over here. So I think in the short term, we've got the parking covered really well. Um, we have had some discussions with the city um, you know, if we really want to make this into an activated public space and provide, you know, extra parking, and I think as Oregon City matures and the, the Willamette Falls becomes more of a tourist magnet, parking is going to be at a real premium. So there are some opportunities to maybe add additional parking over in this area, and we'd like to explore whether maybe the city can come to the table and participate in providing some more public access parking. Specific to that, there are there's about three acres here that uh, could be available. Uh, we have talked to that property owner. That's a kind of a dilapidated couple of buildings that are there are falling down. Yes. Got a question. You know, this is the third project that we've built next to a treatment plant, and they uh, they have upgraded them. They've uh, fixed them to where they're usually not a problem. There might be some extraordinary event that might happen. Uh, the one that we did on the Columbia high-end condominiums went from 300,000 to a million five. Uh, those sold right through the recession. They were subterranean parking uh, in the floodplain, and they're right next to the treatment plant. In Lake Oswego, the 540 units that we built there, right next to the uh, treatment plant in Lake Oswego, we did get some complaints maybe 10 years ago, but consistently they are upgrading them to the point to where it isn't a, a conflict. So we have been uh, in the sewer treatment business uh, by uh, just falling out uh, being in these uh, locations. So it's, it really hasn't been a problem. We don't expect it to, to be a problem. Yes, sir. Is how long is Main Street going to be closed through 2018? Uh, no, it'll. Uh, I just talked to them this morning because I knew that would be a question. They expect to have it uh, open uh, by the end of summer and maybe even in August. So that's moving along well. There was obviously some unique issues there of getting that uh, built, uh, but nothing different. It's the business that we're in, and you run into problems. So, yes. Um. So what are the, <clears throat> the points of entry from, let's, I'm just assuming McLaughlin and then down where we're out on Main Street, um, how, how do you get in from the sides? Well, Oregon City Shopping Center, you have uh, dunes that comes this way, comes around, and comes back here. So that's one point of entry. You have Main Street that comes this way. We promoted uh, having this connection here, which goes over to Washington Street. But ODOT uh, uh, said they did not want to have that. So even though we'll have this as an emergency ingress egress, which will have bollards on it, uh, that won't be a formal uh, point. So. so on Main Street there, I'm just thinking when you're going, oh, okay. there, there are two accesses at the Oregon City Shopping Center. There's Firestone Alley, which is on the east side of McLaughlin that cuts straight down to Main Street, and then there's the other route that goes over towards the Willamette River and loops around under. So there are really three accesses. Okay, so you'll be able to get in from the left? From, from, from the shopping center side as well as from the, from the, river, the Willamette River side. Yes. I'd love to see you pressure uh, TriMet to get transit. I don't think that'll be that big of a pressure point given the amount of people that will be there. If you take the number of units and hit that times two, that's a lot of people that should be supportable for that program. Yes? As far as access to the water, is that at Sandy Beach? This, we will have some Sandy Beach here and some there. Uh, originally, we were going to <clears throat> cut back what's called Track C. It's all this frontage uh, Remove the trees. Uh, we had uh, several meetings with the commission out on site. 
We went back and we saved some spots. Uh, right now, it's our intent to grade part of track C, move that dirt from that location up to the street. Street takes about 40,000 cubic yards to be going in there to bring it up to uh, elevation 52. The floodplain is uh, 50.7. All of the units will be at about 53. They'll be out of the floodplain. So it's, uh, it's really designed to be close to the water uh, and uh, you know, be totally insurable. Yes? Um, that giant pipe has been installed right near Main Street and that, can you tell me what that's for? The, uh, there was a requirement for a new 40 inch, uh, 48 inch outfall. Uh, John could probably tell us everything about that. <laughs> That's uh, kind of pre-planning on the part of the city to uh, be able to accept uh, water from off-site and from across the freeway. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a necessity. Well, if that's all the questions, uh, thank you very much. All right, well, that was a lot of information for us to absorb, but uh, the good news is everything's moving forward. Everything's in motion, and soon we'll have people living in phase one. Uh, so it'll be a living, breathing machine. Live, work, play. That's kind of the, the future of what um, people are looking for, not to have to go in their car to go out to eat, to do their recreational activities, but actually be able to enjoy it right out their door. So we're gonna let Lloyd continue up here as he talks about the mixed use development, uh, which includes the Hampton Inn and Suites by Hilton, as well as some retail and residential. And it'll be located right across from the uh, Trails End Center. So Lloyd, here you go. Well, the, um, the Cove project, uh, we've been working on it with Ed now on and off. It's had a few starts and stops, but uh, for going on eight years or so, and believe it or not, that doesn't win the prize in my office for the longest running project. I've got one that's been going for 13 years now. Um, but uh, we are very excited about what we see here in Oregon City. Oregon City, uh, I believe, is poised to really transform itself over the next generation. And we're already seeing <clears throat> some significant uh, development activity in Oregon City. Uh, the, the legacy project is great, but I think we've got some real projects that are happening now. The, the garden apartment project, which we're the architects for, you'll start to see foundations go in and buildings go vertical there here this summer. Um, the, uh, the Cove Waterfront Project will be going through the land use approval process and our goal is to get that into construction next year. Um, in the meantime, we have um, several other projects and I'd like to talk about one of them uh, with you tonight. Um, you may recognize uh, this site. This is on Washington Street. <clears throat> um, this is Abernathy Creek here, so we're just off the map uh, a little bit here. This is the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center here. So if that gets everybody um, oriented, <clears throat> you know, this site is bounded by 17th Street on the south, and 17th has had the railroad crossing closed. This is the railroad right-of-way here. And Washington Street, <clears throat> um, I guess, I don't know if that's south or east. It's kind of southeast. Um, at the north end, we'll call it north, <clears throat> is the railroad depot, and uh, there's a new cafe there. How many people have been to the cafe? Um, you know, if you haven't been there, be sure to check it out. It's very cool. Uh, so this will, will uh, involve development of virtually all the property between the railroad depot and 17th Street. The one holdout is the auto repair <clears throat> shop that's at the corner here. So it's about four acres. <clears throat> um, there'll be two phases of development, and we're currently... Uh, you know, going through the land use approval process with the city. Um, the first phase will be a Hampton Inn and Suites uh, hotel by Hilton. Uh, so Hilton, there's a, a group of investors that have secured approval from Hilton for a 100-room Hampton Inn and Suites hotel. And that's what these three renderings um, to the right are showing here. 
Um, the hotel will be um, a five-story structure. Uh, the ground level will include <clears throat> some meeting spaces and so forth. Uh, the dining room, uh, it's a two-story vaulted dining room, swimming pools and exercise facilities, and uh, a couple of uh, guest rooms next to the meeting space that can be used for hospitality suites. And uh, then the remainder of the units, um, you know, 97 or 8 units are on the four upper floors. <clears throat> um, the design of the building here is not your typical Hampton Inn. You know, we have tried to um, follow the, the required Hampton Inn brand standards, such as the uplit cornices and the punched windows and so forth. Uh, but we've tried to adapt it uh, to fit better with the Northwest and Oregon City. So uh, we've incorporated some, <clears throat> uh, some wood-looking siding. It's actually uh, simulated wood, but I think you'll be very impressed with what it looks like, um, as well as some uh, uh, cement stucco um, you know, type uh, elements as well. Um, the, you know, the, one of the prominent features of the hotel, <clears throat> you know, if you know where this location is, this is Washington Street coming from downtown, and it curves just a little bit and changes direction. So if you, um, you know, stand on Washington Street and look this way, the end of the hotel uh, will be in your view. <clears throat> and uh, we have designed <clears throat> um, a, a vertical... Uh, stair tower element that will be lit from within at night. So imagine it's a sort of a giant lantern-like element that will be glowing at the end. And we've, we've spent some extra time thinking about this and trying to design something which we think maybe uh, has the potential to become kind of an iconic sort of a, um, a symbol for this, uh, for this project. Uh, so that's the Hampton Inn and Suites project. That's the first phase of what we're calling Abernathy Place. The second phase of Abernathy Place occupies the remainder of the site. <clears throat> the site is really split in two. There's a, a big sewer line that cuts through the site that has an easement on it. So that limits uh, some of the options that we um, you know, have explored. <clears throat> the, um, the second part of the site is, um, is being planned as a mixed-use project with some ground-level commercial retail space that will be at street level, <clears throat> and then four levels of residential units over the top. And uh, this is designed so there is parking underneath the building in the back behind. There'll be um, you know, retail shops and so forth uh, fronting the sidewalk, and then a, a layer of parking behind, which you can access either here or... This plan shows it here. We've actually tucked it under in the back here. Uh, the remainder of the parking is on grade parking um, in a buffer between the railroad tracks and the building. Uh, so we've moved the building as far away from the railroad tracks as we can. And um, the, uh, the project is designed <clears throat> with the main entrance um, at this corner. <clears throat> so this access that goes into the railroad depot this is currently um, owned by the Urban Renewal Agency, I believe, and there is a plan for the ownership of that property to transfer it to the city. Um, you know, per working with the city, we're viewing that roadway that comes in here almost like a, a public street right-of-way. So there'll be sidewalks and parking, and we're designing the building facing it as if it's facing a street <clears throat> uh, with the corner entrance to the building that leads through to the parking. And at the, at the top floor, there's a, a roof deck here that could have a fire pit and sort of sun lounges and, and some indoor community space for the residents. Um, this will be something on the order of 120 or 130 units and something on the order of 10 or, 10 or 12,000 square feet of commercial space. So happy to answer any questions. So, any way to uh, any thought about how to um, coordinate with the end of the Oregon Trail? Um, kind of a theme there that we can, you know, it doesn't look like it happened on the hotel, but I didn't know if you were going to do it on the uh, the residential side over there. You know, as as an architect and a designer, it's it's an interesting balancing act. Sometimes Oregon City is a very historic place, 
uh, in it, you know, it can be tempting to, uh, you know, to do obvious things. You know, if it's a western town, to put board and bat siding and you know make it look like an old western town. If it's a historic, you know, city here, um, you know, do we want to design the buildings so they look like they were maybe built a hundred years ago? Um, you know, my uh, goal as an architect is to is to choose architectural materials which are indigenous, so the wood siding, native stone, um, those kinds of things, and architectural forms that are traditional. So, you know, older buildings um, were typically, a, a lot of them, if you look around town, the Masonic Temple, the courthouse and so forth are designed uh, with a sort of a classical order to them where they have a base and then the next floors above the base are different, and then the top floors are different. So it's a base and a shaft and a top. And if you look at modern buildings, oftentimes they don't follow this same um, architectural order. So um, there are a lot of things that we're doing to try to tie this to history. And um, our goal at the end of the day is to have <coughs> a, a building that people will like, um, that they'll look at and they won't say, oh, gosh, that was just built yesterday, or that was built in 2016 because it looks like all those other 2016 buildings. We'd like to design something that has <clears throat> a bit of a timeless character to it. And that's hard to really put into specific features, but I think it's one of those things that you, you know it when you see it. Um, so, yes, we will be incorporating native stone. We will be trying to do things that make the building um, blend in with the historic, uh, you know, character here. But we don't want to just, um, you know, take historic themes and sort of paste them over the top. Um, other questions? <laughs> so are any of the spaces there live work, or are they just going to be separate at this time? You know, in, in this case, we actually have a challenge. As much as we would love to do live work here, um, this, um, the, the street on Washington Street is about 10 feet below the flood elevation. And uh, so, and it slopes down, it's a little bit higher here, it slopes down, it's maybe six or seven feet below flood elevation. By the time we get down here, it's about 10 feet below. So in order to comply with the FEMA requirements for flood and so forth, um, we're not able to put any residential uses, even live work, um, on that lower level. Um, you know, we can put certain kinds of commercial uses there, and we're still kind of working through all of the rules and regulations. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're certain that we could do um, an open air sort of a thing with flower markets or, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables or gift shops or that sort of thing that might have shutters that roll down. Um, we're hoping that we can actually build enclosed storefronts using floodproof materials that won't be damaged in, in the event of an occasional flood here, but we're still navigating all of the federal regulations related. Um, I have a real concern on, as an example, the, the motif of the hotel as well as this with a historic site right across the street about doing whatever we can to be within the theme of the historic nature of Oregon City and what we're trying to represent and sell. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Gail? So I just had a comment about um, our site, the end of the Oregon Trail, is an interpretive center. And the hoops, I mean, it just gives the, it's art, right? Mm -hmm. it's, done, it's not authentic in that it, you know, is a historic building. It's not like Stevens Crawford or anything like that. So I think the story and the feeling of things have to blend. We haven't had any real problem selling our story um, with that interpretation of the mm -hmm. big hoops, and does that make sense? Yes, and I totally agree. I think the you know the hoops are a very um, you know a, a nice way to draw you know to make a reference to a historical feature that was a big part of the Oregon Trail. 
you know, I'm not sure that we want to have all the buildings that are in that neighborhood all of a sudden have hoops on them. I think that might take away from the specialness of the hoops at the interpretive center itself. So, um, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying and, and um, you know, we have, um, you know, tried to be um, sensitive to that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with the uh, other recently built Hilton um, uh, Hampton Inns, um, but uh, we have worked with Hilton very hard to come up with something that is more sensitive and more historic in nature uh, and uh, have convinced them to let us back away from some of these more modern, you know, they, they have, um, you know, cornices that are sort of Corinthian, you know, capital things and, you know, other things which are, I, I don't think, the right thing either. So we're a little bit caught in the middle on the hotel here. And, uh, you know, I, I hope, uh, you know, I, a beauty's in the eye of the beholder. We've We've gotten various comments from various people on this. We have gotten a lot of people that said they liked it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we have addressed um, the, the concern about the historic setting here in a way that will work for everybody. So uh, what kind of time frame are we looking at on, or that you're hoping for on mm -hmm. phase one and then phase two mm -hmm. and then Question number two is how much of the surface parking that we're seeing there is part of phase one, mm -hmm. and what happens inside the footprint of that phase two building until phase two gets built? Uh -huh. Okay, good questions. Um, well, so the timing, uh, we have submitted applications to the city for land use approval. We're going through that process right now. There will be, that process will be ongoing. We're, we are hoping to be in a position to break ground here later this summer. Um, you know, this summer, this summer, fall, uh, the construction of the hotel will be something on the order of maybe 15, 16, 17 months, something on that order. We'll do it as fast as we can, but there, there are going to be some issues such as um, improving the, the ground um, before we build the foundations that will take some time. Uh, while the, the first phase, so the amount of parking which is um, allocated to the hotel, you know, basically the parking lot in the back up to about this point, um, those parking stalls <clears throat> um, accrue to the hotel. And the hotel <clears throat> ownership also owns the Hackett House here. We did um, have a, a design uh, advice session with the Historic Review Board uh, and also a, a design hearing with the Historic Review Board where we uh, reviewed three or four alternative approaches to doing the hotel and this is the approach that they recommended and they have endorsed uh, the project and feel good about the, the relationship. I think the Hackett House currently has some uh, tenants in it, office space and so forth. Um, that In the short term that will maintain but that may evolve into another use. Maybe it'll be a bridal shop or a uh, bistro restaurant or meeting spaces or something, you know, something else that's in keeping with the historic nature of it. Um, so during um, construction of the, of the first phase, um, there are some existing tenants um, along Washington Street and a landscape uh, maintenance tenant in the back. And I think some of those tenants will stay in place at least for some period of time during the uh, construction of the first phase. Um, you know, I think the goal is to get approval of the second phase and to begin moving that forward right on the heels of the first phase. So uh, it's not, you know, it's not years down the road. I think it's it's maybe a year or so. And um, these, you know, these two projects. I think this is an example of how activity like the the Blue Heron site and like. Um, uh, the other things happening in Oregon City, the first phase of the cove, when you get activity, it, it draws attention and it breeds more activity. And I anticipate more of this kind of development coming to Oregon City in the future, in the near future here. David? Hold on. Um, just quickly, you had a lot of units coming on in, over a period of three, four years. Mm -hmm. What kind of absorption um, 
modeling are you guys doing? Is it going to fill up really fast, or is it going to take some time? I mean, a lot of folks haven't even found us yet, so. Uh -huh, sure. Um, well, I've had that discussion with, uh, you know, with the developers, the Grand Peaks Properties people that are doing the first phase, um, you know, Spencer there specifically, and I talked about this just recently. Um, originally, the, the next phase, the waterfront phase of the cove was going to be bigger units that would maybe be targeted at a little different uh, user. And uh, with the redesign, with the smaller units, a combination of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, a few three bedrooms, and live work, um, it's, it's targeted at, at, a, at a more similar kind of a market. Um, Spence's opinion, and I think our development clients from Vancouver, BC, and Ed, are all of the opinion that this is a big market, that uh, all boats float in a rising tide. And that the dynamics that are at work in Portland, <clears throat> where there has been this huge influx of inf infill development in the inner city, which is um, getting to a point where it's starting to get pushback. Uh, and with the homeless and the, and the low income housing issues and the talking about doing rent controls and so forth, um, there seem to be a lot of pieces falling into place that will maybe put a damper on um, additional development in Portland um, in the coming years. And uh, so we're anticipating that there will be a shift, as there have been in other urban areas, uh, where some of the uh, well-positioned um, you know, cities and neighborhoods around the outside of the urban core will pick up the slack. And I think Oregon City is very well positioned to, um, you know, to, to fill this unmet uh, need for, for housing in the Portland metro area. Do you, do you have the rental rates estimated yet? About you know, we're, we're designing the buildings. I sort of see the pro formas from time to time. Um, I, I, I don't really know what the rental rates are. I do, I do know that they are substantially higher than what we were thinking they were a few years ago. Um, you know, I'm amazed. I've been touring projects in Portland in a, you know, a, a not very special two-bedroom unit in a not very special neighborhood in Portland. Um, you know, gosh, they're getting 2,000, 2,200, 2,300 a month. You know, I don't think we're going to have those kind of rates here, but that's what's happening in our market. If there's no any, no more questions, um, going, going, gone. All right. Well, I'll I'll hang around if any of you have questions you want to ask um, after after the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Again, we always talk about the saying: activity breeds activity, and I think when you see the combination of what's taking place in the cove, both in phase one and phase two combined with what would occur here with the Hampton Inn and Suites by Hilton, as well as the mixed-use residential with the retail, it's just going to be a huge drawing card. Um, and it, those are the things that gets people excited to want to come back and invest uh, with their businesses. So moving along, we have another speaker. Um, Lloyd touched on it a little bit about the bistro that has opened up at the railroad station. So we're going to have Blaine um, share a few comments with us about uh, his vision for that. Be real brief. Um, so we uh, opened or uh, pitched the idea of the bistro uh, to the Urban Renewal Agency back in January of 2013. Then it took about a year to write the plan. Um, the city took a couple of years to do building upgrades that needed were needed. And then uh, we signed the lease in February of 2016. So I had budgeted three months for the build out, uh, it ended up taking 11 months, or we, uh, I was told do six months, not three. So I did six, but it took 11. So uh, we opened in January, almost four, four years to the date, uh, to the day, um, uh, opening in January 2nd of 2017. So then we were, that was quickly followed by a 40 year historic storm, uh, snowstorm. So it's, it's been, a, it's been a, uh, an interesting ride. However, the positive is that this has been a phenomenal project and uh, lots of uh, great response. I looked on Facebook this morning and our, our food reviews are at like 4.9. 
So you can't, can't get much better than that. So uh, there's just been a phenomenal response and we appreciate all your support. Having said that, it takes, you can't get from zero to 60 in uh, three or four months. So our sweet spot is an average of 60 customers per day at an average of $12 per ticket. Right now we're at twelve twenty-seven per ticket, so that's good. But we're at only about forty to forty-five uh, on the average. So we need probably thirty to forty more people a day, you know, uh, so to to uh, be coming in. So it's a huge effort, a great lift, and I think a lot of people just assume, well, it's there. Of course, it's doing well, but we need the community support to get us to that place where we're able to break even. So uh, anyway, that's that, but uh, we're, we're thinking of shortening our hours a little bit on each end, going from eight to six, and then really focusing on evening events um, and, and renting the whole place out in the evenings. So, you know, it's just entrepreneurism. You're just feeling your way along. You're, you're having to get creative and just to make it work. So, but all in all, it's a really wonderful thing. Um, and then First City Cycles, um, the win this winter, we last year we were profitable on Main Street and uh, after five years. And um, things were going along great. I thought this would be our banner year, but uh, we got uh, hit with the 40-year historic snowstorm followed by all-time record high rains for February, March, and April. Ac absolutely decimated the bicycling industry in the Northwest. I mean, we're the brunt of jokes around the country um, for how, how it's hurt, hurt us. So it, we had always planned that the bistro at the train station would um, incorporate bicycles, bicycle accessories, repairs, but it was kind of like, you know, um, First City Cycles 2 or First City Cycles Light. But uh, we were, with the with storm issues, uh, we were, um, uh, we kind of ramped that up more quickly. So now the bike shop is completely at the train station. So it's been an interesting experience. Like our, um, our current customers, they say, this is interesting. Uh, but the new people that come in from the bistro, you know, come in, they say, whoa, this is wonderful. So we're, we're really getting a, a very positive overall response. And I think that it's going to be a formula that works for us. Yeah, so lots of exciting things. And uh, we're excited to be there. And uh, again, appreciate your support. And uh, a lot of you, I, I know, come there often. And some of you have names carved in, in the tables. But uh, so we're going to keep things exciting and try and expand our menu and, and do some other things. So keep keep looking. We represent all six of the Oregon City breweries. Thank you, Craig. And uh, yeah, people love Oregon City Brewing and all the others. So yeah, just appreciate your support. Gail, I'm going to come share about the. Yeah. And I, I might add that one of the best parts of Blaine being the owner of the Bistro is on certain evenings he plays the guitar. What, when's your next uh, major re event? Uh, every Friday and Saturday night from 6 to 9. Every Friday and Saturday from 6 to 9. Okay, put it on the calendar. And Gail's going to share a few words about what's going on at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center. We are uh, the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center, but we're a visitor center as well. So being an interpretive center and visitor center is very complimentary. So we review everything we do based on visitors, and of course we have a great story to tell and lots and lots of partners. And I want to thank many of you in this room for even working on and building and developing the end of the Oregon Trail. We still have people coming for, on their bucket list. They're traveling the Oregon Trail. So a lot today, all these developments are so great for tourism because the more we can offer and work together, Sam Drevo and I had a couple years trying to, how do we get our visitors to you and his to us? And last week or a couple weeks ago, he brought a group of kids to us. They toured and then they went kayaking. So we want to do more of that. Blaine and I have ideas and, and don't worry, Phil, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> so, um, many of you, we are here and working hard to keep it alive because of you. So we have lots of partners. Um, we, for our stories, are inclusive, diverse, and authentic. So we're partners with Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde. Uh, of course, the city owns the buildings, and then Clackamas Heritage Partners um, manages the programming. So we developed, um, 
we want to have 300 people a day, or how are we going to handle 300 people a day? And by the way, we'll need additional parking, and I think parking lot could go up a few levels. So that's an idea. But um, what, I'm, what we're doing is the Oregon Trail experience. So back around the back of the site, we're representing the sites along the trail. So what that does is it brings us to more partners because we are a National Park Oregon Trail project. And because of that, then we are going to take um, the trail and and actually, we did receive a grant from the Metro Enhancement Grant that Jerry Herman, thank you, helped on a nature trail. So now we have a nature trail. We have indigenous trees along the way. We have wagons, because um, you start in Missouri and you walk the trail and you end up in Oregon City. And many of you have walked it with me probably twice or whatever, but come if you want um, to see what we're doing. So the grant paid for the trail, the plantings, and some exhibits. And uh, we're working on one of the exhibits that we're working on, um, in addition to the Metro Enhancement Grant, is Lowell Miles with Miles Fiberglass is, um, did a prototype of Independence Rock, because that's significant uh, for our school groups and the stories as we do tours around the site, because um, they wrote on that. It's granite rock. So we've been working on where to put it, how to put it, and um, you can say something if you did. you want to say something, Jerry? OK. So um, anyway, Miles Fiberglass, Lowell Miles is donating the rock. We want to thank you so much and your work. and will be a value of over $25,000. So Lowell is on our board. He is, you were one of the first board members, weren't you? And he's still here and passionate. So without all the partners, you know. So with that though, we have lots of passionate historians in our community. And we all, the Oregon City Foundation, Parks Foundation, there's, and then there's the um, Oregon City uh, Coordinating Committee, Clackamas County Heritage Council, and many, many more groups. And everyone is passionate about the stories. And we're stronger together than apart. So the more we connect with those stories, no one's going to come for one thing. They're not going to come just to eat. They're not going to come just for one thing. want to give them everything. So come and see me. OK, thank you very much, Gail, for uh, the update. Um, sounds like some exciting things going on at your facility. And we look forward to being down there and visiting it. Uh, in the essence of time, uh, Eric's going to go ahead and have his presentation on all the economic successes that we've had in Oregon City uh, either next month or at one of our upcoming forums. But we did want to go ahead and have um, Dan Fowler come on up and talk about some of the new businesses that are moving in uh, down at 14th and Washington. Exciting times. Wow, what a day, huh? Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but and for those of you that have never been at the Abernathy Center or down in the gardens, thank you for being here. And there's more to the gardens if you peek that way. There's an East Lawn and restrooms and everything. So but it's a fun place to be, but thank you for coming. Um, back in the 90s and before that, I remember in Washington Street had two machine shops and, and a post office, and then a space that is now a nice little bakery that was just another used machine sales office. Uh, and over the last 20 years, it's really changed. So people think, wow, you know, look at Oregon City and we see Main Street's really changed. I hear it all the time, isn't Main Street great? Well, Washington Street's next, folks, and it's already happening. I mean, it's really starting to happen. It doesn't happen overnight, but if you think about it, and Craig, I'm really glad that you're here because a lot of pieces to the puzzle, I think you can sense, are falling into place. And there's a reason why people are looking at housing and doing things down here because of some of the amenities that are already, that are already here. But when you've got a, a Tony's Fish Market, 
an institution that's been here a long time. And you got Spicer Brothers, so you got fruit. And then you got a little bakery down the street that is fabulous. And you got a beauty salon and other activities. And then you throw in the mix a great brew to, I mean, I haven't tried all 27 yet. Okay, but I'm working on it. But they've got some great brews that are made right here in Oregon City, right in their location. And Olympic, uh, I'm saying it wrong, Olympic Provisions, but you know what I mean. Uh, a great little statement restaurant, not only good food, but a, a statement type restaurant with their, uh, with their image that they have in Portland and beyond. That starts to change the whole impression of Oregon City. And that's, that's what's happening. And I see that continue to happen. And that takes time, but it's, it's coming. And our time is really here. So um, it's a great thing. And you, you, that's, it allows more things to happen. So hats off to you. Hats off to the other people that have really brought that change about. You know, these are big things. But all those little pieces is how you get to this. And that's, that's what's happened in Oregon City. So uh, that's all for me. All right. That's quite a bit. Thanks, Dan. We appreciate it. Well, I just personally, on behalf of the Oregon City Business Alliance, want to thank each and every one of you for coming today. It's a beautiful day. Enjoy your walk up the, the promenade there. Enjoy the scenery of Abigail's Gardens. And we look forward to coming back and using this facility again in the future, Dan. Uh, I want to thank all our presenters today for some excellent um, PowerPoints, illustrations, renderings and coming to prepare to answer all the questions. Uh, always remember the fourth Tuesday of each month is when we have our forums. Uh, we're still working on the theme for next month, uh, but we'll be getting the invitations out to you as soon as we have that finalized. So with that being said, uh, again, thanks for coming and we'll see you next month. <laughs>